Hello everyone, and welcome back to Lies, where I talk about rendering errors, uh, human errors, and the duplicitous nature of flags. Uh, and of course, tell all the stories that got left out of the episodes, because there simply was not enough time. Uh, oh, speaking of time, it is a million and a half degrees in this room, so I'm going to try and keep this one a little bit short. Um, so, let's begin with the places that I screwed up, uh, because even in trying to keep this as streamlined as possible, uh, there were some things that I just messed up or didn't catch or got somewhere a little bit fuzzy in the editing process. And unlike the rest of the Extra History episodes, there wasn't anybody else on the team who felt like they had so much math that they could give it really a good second set of eyes. So what I missed just stayed. And that is totally on me. Um, oh, there is one thing though. There was a weird flash rendering error in episode two where it looked like the Abbasid Caliphate basically ate the whole world. They did a lot of conquering, but it wasn't quite that extreme. Um, but onto more material stuff. The second time we showed the quadratic equation in episode two, we put the plus and minus sign inside the square root. It should be outside. I didn't even see it till some of you folks pointed out. That should be different. Um, the biggest issue comes in episode three. In the initial draft of the script, I had talked about how that demonstration of integrals uh, can be moved into the fundamental theory of calculus, how we can demonstrate it from it. Uh, it was way, way too long and it got cut. Uh, but somewhere along the way, I ended up calling Newton's demonstration of the foundational idea behind calculus the fundamental theory of calculus, which is a different thing. The fundamental theory is actually about the relation between derivation and integration. And I'm sorry about that one. That is completely my screw up. Um, oh, and lastly, in episode four, I say that hyperbolic geometry, uh, in it, the angles of a triangle add up to more than 180 degrees. That's actually spherical geometry. I got them reversed in my brain. Uh, so sorry about that one. I think those are all the big lies and mistakes. Um, so yeah, let's go on to the fun stuff. Uh, and we have to start with our man Pythagoras because this was some dude. Uh, first off, a lot of people asked about his cult and how culty it was. Uh, unfortunately, I hate to disappoint people, but in a pantheistic society, basically everything's a cult. So you often hear things like the cult of Zeus or the cult of Athena when referring to even major gods. Um, the Pythagorean cult probably wasn't too out there for cults of the day, uh, but Pythagoras himself was a different story. He was hardcore about the purity of math. Um, it's fairly commonly related that he drowned a man at sea for teaching people how to make a dodecahedron. Uh, or maybe it was for revealing the secret of irrational numbers. The ancient sources disagree on that one. Um, but on the other hand, you have to admire his consistency. He had declared fava beans sacred for their benefit to digestion, but as he fled the mob trying to chase him out of Magna Gratia, uh, he saw a field of fava beans ahead of him, and rather than trample the beans, he tried to go around giving his pursuers time to catch him and kill him. Uh, so, you know, Pythagoras. Hopefully that makes the Pythagorean theorem a little bit more fun for everyone who has to study it. I don't know, who knows if that's true, right? Um, but I love that there was a time in history where that could even be a story about a famous mathematician. Uh, oh, and a point of clarification. I talk about the 13 books of Euclid's The Elements, uh, but for those of you out there who don't know, don't worry, it's not actually that long. Um, this got sort of cut from the episode, but back in the day, each scroll was called a book. And so Euclid's elements are actually 13 scrolls long or roughly two decent paperbacks worth of material. Um, oh, in episode two, there are all sorts of minor things that I could tell you, but there's one story that everyone seems dying to hear. So how did Napoleon accidentally steal a version of Euclid from the Vatican that we now consider to be the definitive version that was lost for over a thousand years? Well, get this, uh, when Napoleon invaded Italy, he looted literally cartloads of books. Um, he basically saw the Vatican library and was like, sweet, France could use some more books. Let's take some of those. Um, but you know, the thing about the Vatican Library, especially at the time, was that while it had one of the most extensive collections of books in the world, it wasn't very well organized. 
Um, in fact, no one, not even the Vatican librarians, knew really what was in it. And even today, we're discovering stuff in the Vatican library. Uh, but so anyway, Napoleon just grabbed some stuff and shipped it home. Uh, when someone finally got around to looking at it and just like digging through what they had purloined, um, this dude, uh, blanking on his name at the moment, um, noticed an odd, a Francois Payard. Payrard? Payrard? Francois Payrard. I'm going to go with that. Uh, noticed this weird thing. Basically, every uh, edition of Euclid's Elements that we had began with this tiny subtitle that said, From the Lectures of Theon. Now, one of the copies in Napoleon's book pile did not. So this scholar, this Francois guy, uh, started cross-referencing it with all of his other copies of the Elements. And his copy of Ptolemy because Theon was a known writer and he often did commentaries on other works. And in Theon's commentary on Ptolemy, there's this offhand reference to the fact that he made some changes to Euclid Book 6, Proposition 33. Now, sure enough, when Francois looked at them, he found a different version of 633, of, of Book 6, Proposition 33, in this stolen copy of Euclid from the Vatican. And after combing through it, he found some other small changes, and thus he found something that was the closest thing to the original Euclid that the world had seen for a thousand years. Um, and the whole time, neither Napoleon nor the Vatican actually knew what they had. Uh, so that's that story. Um, on to episode three. Uh, here's where our Walpole fact will come from, but not yet. Uh, oh. In this episode, I talk about the Cartesian coordinate system. It's worth noting that Fermat developed something similar right around the same time, um, and that the ideas uh, that the basic ideas of this coordinate system, or the idea of a coordinate system, uh, the basic ideas were sort of around for a very long time, but uh, basically since antiquity, actually. But we're always missing a few of the essential pieces that Descartes put in. Um, Oh, and speaking of Descartes, while doing this, I stumbled upon a person who uh, deserves their own one-off someday. This guy who is in charge of Dutch military engineering, Simone Steven, I hope I'm getting that right. Um, he helped popularize decimals, he vastly improved hydraulic engineering, and he actually gave Dutch most of its modern science words. Um, and so yeah, he's a cool guy, look him up. Um, oh, and since we're here, for those of you who hadn't heard about squaring the circle, it was just this long-standing problem in mathematics to find a way with just a basic compass and straight edge um, to construct a square that was exactly the same size as a given circle. Uh, this is basically impossible, uh, but this problem also sort of becomes irrelevant once you have calculus because you can effectively do it with integration, right? You can get infinitely close to that. Um, and so that's why we talk about it with the calculus stuff. Uh, in episode four, yeah, episode four, I talk about Ryman a lot. Uh, for those of you guys who are math history buffs, I had to cut most of the stuff about Goss, who laid the groundwork for these things, basically just for the sake of time. Um, oh, Ryman, right, right, right. Uh, he presents to me one of these very cool what-if moments for history because Ryman was a perfectionist and he refused to publish half-finished work like ever but he died young uh his life was cut short by like 39 um, by tuberculosis but when he died and here's the big gut-wrenching what-if to me because his death is is tragic but then the follow-up to his death his housekeeper just burnt all his papers like, who knows what mathematical secrets that brilliant mind had devised that we had just lost forever, right? Um, and that's basically it. Not too much to say about episode five. Uh, oh, except that's not it. You know why? Walpole. Uh, remember how in one of the early episodes I mentioned that John D was a wizard? Well, like any good wizard, he had an obsidian mirror that he stole from the Aztecs to conjure spirits. Because, you know. Um, and guess who ended up with that particular speculum? Horace Walpole. God, I love Horace. Uh, there is a lot of questions about whether D even owned this mirror, and all of the inscriptions on it appear to have been put there by our own dear Horace. 
Uh, but like any good Walpole, he convinced enough people that it was Dee's magic mirror uh, that it's sitting in the British, British Museum uh, to this day. Uh, oh, and a new feature. Some of you had asked for a suggested reading list. Um, this won't be a bibliography for the series because I do want people to go out and explore further than just what we did or look at different sources than we looked at. Uh, but it should give you a place to start if you found this stuff rad. And today's is particularly easy because this series talked about a lot of books. Um, so if you like geometry and want to look more into geometry, I really do highly recommend Euclid's Elements. Uh, for me at least, it made geometry make so much more sense than like high school math ever did. Uh, and if you dug calculus, Newton's Principia is difficult. Um, but if calculus is your thing, it's something I think it's worth looking into and it's really interesting to see these ideas not as a bunch of abstractions, but as, as physical principles and as uh, geometry. Uh, and if you really want to get to the mind-bending stuff, Lobachevsky's geometrical researches on the theory of parallels is where you should be looking. Um, just, you know, you've been warned. Uh, so with that, we're done. Uh, go listen to the fantastic ending music for the video. That should be posted live. Uh, it'll be in a separate video file, but that should be posted at the same time that this video goes up. And join us next week as we dive into the flu pandemic of 1918. See you all then.